Okay, so I'm going to need you guys' help tonight. Uh, I was worried about you. And as I was praying, I really was. I was a little bit uh, worried about how everybody is holding up in these strange times. Now, what I don't want to do is turn this into permission to, uh, to complain because I don't think that helps. It gets our eyes facing the wrong direction. But I want to, uh, I want to just point out one quick thing in Scripture tonight, and then I want to both review and hear testimony of the things that God has shared with you from the unseen realm. Because I want to get our, our eyes focused back on that. And that's why I want you guys to be ready to, to testify as well. Um, so just as a, a show of hands, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, let's see if I could ask this question so it makes it easy to answer. On a scale of 1 to 10, and you guys can raise hands too, those who get your video on. Uh, on a scale of, or you could push that little hand thing, that would be cool, push that little, uh, that little happy hand or whatever. On a scale of 1 to 10, how many of you are tired of all the circumstances surrounding COVID above a five? <laughs> okay, <laughs> me too. Uh, way above a five. Yeah, way above a five, so we could get up around 10. Uh, is, is anybody feeling any weariness regarding the political uncertainty? None yet? Okay. A little, a little. Okay. Is anybody having fun in the political uncertainty? Actually, <laughs> I am a little bit. Um, so, so uh, you know, we've we've looked for a little while at at looking at God, and I mean, looking at the world as God sees it. Last week we talked a little bit about not regarding anyone according to flesh. How do you do that? And then how do you, you know, fundamentally, this is not a, a mechanical question or a doctrinal question. It's a relational question. The way to figure out how God sees something is to ask him and then listen and expect an answer because that's what you get in a relationship when you ask a question. And uh, I'm sure there's other ways, and I don't want to single any of them out, and I don't want to um, make it difficult for any of them to be um, not, like feel like they're less significant or whatever. So we'll see when we get in. We're going to try to recoup a bunch of them. But I want us to be sustained through these times by the overwhelming evidence that there is. The overwhelming evidence. And I was thinking widespread, overwhelming evidence, yes. I was thinking about, uh, and, and if you don't mind, Riley, you'll have to redo your preset, but I'm going to stick this mic. This is kind of a disadvantage for you guys, but I'm going to stick it back here a little bit so it's easier for everybody to get to quick in case we start sharing things fast. The evidence is supposed to sustain us. It's supposed to carry us emotionally, and it's supposed to carry us spiritually. So, uh, faith, evidence, and the sustainable hope. Let's see where we're at. Stewarding our encouragements. This is out of Hebrews chapter 10, the last verse, and the first verse of chapter 11. But ours is not a shrinking back toward destruction, but faithfulness for the preservation of the soul. Now, faithfulness is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of unseen realities. Now, this is David Bentley Hart. And I like his translation a ton. I wish... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Hebrews 10, 39, and 11, 1. It's the last verse in chapter 10, first verse in chapter 11. Uh, that is kind of small, huh? Sorry about that. Um, so, anyway, in this particular verse, I, I kind of wish that he had said faith instead of faithfulness. But he said faithfulness, and, and it, 
It's kind of cool in a way because faithfulness is also a relational word as opposed to a doctrinal word. And a word just like a, you know, like, uh, I know I labored a long time in my life uh, trying to have faith and, and judging whether I did or didn't. And a lot of time in that time, I acted very faithfully. I kept following, I kept serving, I kept working, I kept loving, I kept believing, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, here's another verse. This is in 2 Corinthians. Because for us, the transitory lightness of our affliction is bringing about ever more exorbitantly the age's weight of glory. Now, how is that for some cool words in a verse that you probably have no idea you've ever heard before? Uh, this is in 2 Corinthians 14, uh, I mean, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. Because for us, the transitory lightness of our affliction is bringing about ever more exorbitantly the age's weight of glory. Not looking to things seen, but instead to the things not seen. For the things seen are for but a season, but the things not seen are of the age. In the New American Standard, you know, it says that the things seen are temporal or temporary. The things not seen are eternal. But I like the way the age talks about it because it means that they're both running through time and they're both in a purpose. The uh, image of the Revelation song that we sang at the end is that there is this enormous honor service going on in heaven, whether we know it or not. Gehazi's situation, the angels were there before his eyes were opened up. Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father before uh, that vision was granted to Stephen. And he was loving Saul, later Paul, before Paul ever knew about it. And so this stuff is real, and it's going on. And I want to just cover a tiny bit of the words in it. So destruction, preservation, substance, and evidence on this first verse out of uh, Hebrews 10, 39, and 11. Parapoiesis is to experience security, okay? It means keeping safe. It's the word for preservation here. You can see why the translation is that way. It has to do with acquiring something, gaining something, or possessing something. The word destruction is the word apoleia, and it means ruin or loss. A lot of times, like in the King James and stuff, it's translated destruction or damnation or something like that. But I wanted to point out that the base meaning of this word is to, is to suffer ruin or loss. I understand how it gets applied if you have a theology of separation and you think the resolution of things is going to be through damnation. But what it really means is that things rot, things corrupt, things rust, and it, they fall apart. And the opposite of that, of course, is the preservation or the keeping. Now, the word down here, substance, is an amazing word, hypostasis. If you've studied theology, you, that might remind you of the word that's used in theological terms to talk about the nature of Jesus. And um, there's, a, there's a cool passage that it's in. But it means substantial nature, the essence, or I thought this was a beautiful phrase, the actual being of a thing, its reality. Its reality. And then evidence is elegkos, and it's the act of proving something, a conviction, and it means not just a conviction like I'm convinced. It means like a person being convicted. The evidence has all been presented, and yes, this is the truth about what you did. And that's where the idea of evidence of truth comes up. So ours is not a shrinking back towards destruction, meaning ours is not a shrinking back toward ruin. but is faithfulness for everything being kept, everything being preserved. Now, faithfulness is the substance, the real meaning of what's going on. And so that was the one that started um, stirring me about, Lord, we need, I mean, we need some encouragement. We need some encouragement in the midst of this process. And it's the source of things hoped for, and it's the conviction of, the evidence of, the, the proof that's been presented about what's going on. 
about unseen realities. Now, the next verse down here uh, is, it says, because for us the transitory lightness of our affliction is bringing about ever more exorbitantly the age's weight of glory. In other words, this thing that we're engaged in as we're, for instance, trying to stand for election integrity and for what we believe God's will to be in the United States, this thing is not just about that. Our standing in it is about the transformation of us as well. And it's changing us. And I know I've talked to some of you and, I, and stuff is changing in our lives. It gets challenged. And then we, we have a choice of how to respond. And that's because we live with uh, testimonies coming from all different directions. We have a testimony that comes out of our own heart and mind. We have a testimony that floods us from all around. And I hope that you're disciplining how much news you watch. Because, boy, oh, boy, it can get overwhelming a little bit. And almost all those testimonies of the news and of the reports, and even the ones that are like pro-Trump or pro-Biden or whatever, those things are witnesses coming in from kind of a horizontal level. But then there is another category of news, and that is revelation. It comes in the forms of prophecies. Uh, how many of you have heard somebody prophesy about this issue? Okay. It comes in the form of, of your own uh, vision, seeing things. I've seen some, a couple of things that, while I was with the Lord. Uh, anybody have any dreams about this in this room? Cool. Uh, so see, these are the evidences that our hope is based in. And we can't let go of them. And these evidences are very often spoken contrary to by the testimony on a horizontal level of the world in the news. And I get, I get mad when somebody that I think should be standing firm uh, starts giving in. I go, why are you doing that? You know, why are you doing that? And, uh, but then I realize, okay, I'm going through a transformation in my own life as well. Like I am conscious of having faith in a way that I don't think I've ever been in my life. And I want to talk just a second about that and explain what I mean. Um, now, it also says the transitory... Whoop! Back up. Whoop! Whoop! Get out of here. Whoop! There it is. The transitory lightness... Is anybody here willing with me to define what we're going through with COVID, with the political tension, as something of transitory lightness? Now, not everybody raised their hand there. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's say, there we go. Uh, another way to say it, no, I don't think not a big deal is the it, is that it's something that is coming to pass, literally. It's going to pass. And it is not as heavy as it seems. Now, there's two ways to arrive at that conclusion. You could go back and we could read more in there. And uh, Paul talked about, well, maybe I should read it because I don't want you to have to take my word for this one. I think this might be worthwhile. Uh, okay. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I didn't mark it. I wasn't planning on reading it. All right, so where are we at there? We're at 17. Um, all right, let me read just a little bit here. But we have this treasure, this is starting in verse 7, in vessels of clay. So the, the uh, second, second Corinthians 4, 7. Second Corinthians 4, 7. Sorry. Thanks, Ryan. No, 7. I'm going to set the context for this concept of transitory lightness. 
But we have this treasure in vessels of clay so that the power excellence might be of God and not come from us. In every way afflicted, yet not crushed. Perplexed, yet not despairing. Persecuted, yet not forsaken. Cast down, yet not perishing. Always bearing in the body the dying of Jesus so that Jesus' life might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. For we, are live, for we, the living, are always being delivered over to death on account of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Hence, death is operating in us, but life in you. And having the same spirit of faithfulness in keeping with the Scripture, I had faith, therefore I spoke. We both have faith and thus also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and will present us along with you. For all things are for your sake, so that the grace that has spread throughout evermore persons might make thanksgiving abound to the glory of God. Hence, we do not grow weary, but if indeed our outward man is wasting away, still our inward is being renewed day by day. Because for us, the transitory lightness of our affliction is bringing about ever more exorbitantly the age's weight of glory. Not looking to the things seen, but instead to the things not seen. For the things seen are but for a season, but the things not seen are of the age. He goes on and says, Now we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a home of the age, in the heavens not made by hands. For herein we groan, fervently longing to clothe ourselves about in our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For indeed in this tent, being burdened, we groan, since we do not wish to unclothe ourselves, but rather clothe ourselves, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who wrought us for this very thing is God, the one who has given us the pledge of the Spirit. Therefore, being always confident and knowing that when at home with the body, we are away from uh, home separated from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by what is seen. So, I, I in no way want this to be a downer. What I want us to understand, though, is that this situation does not have the capacity to reach into the kingdom of heaven and soil it. And we need to keep our eyes open to that reality and our hearts open to it. Otherwise, it'll be difficult to remain faithful to the witness, to the stand, to the intercession, to all of that down here. Because a discouraged person uh, is not a terribly effective person. Even after all this, Paul said, I know I would rather be clothed with Christ, but for your sake, I'm going to stay here. And he did so with great joy. So that's kind of what I mean by that. I, the transitory lightness of our affection. I personally think that if we can laugh a little at these trials that have a tendency to make, and my initial reaction is not to laugh. Like, for instance, the hypocrisy of governors and leaders that impose sanctions and don't follow them absolutely drives me crazy. It absolutely drives me crazy. When I see 2,000 people come out in front of a guy's business to defend it from the abuses that, uh, um, the, yeah, Cuomo and uh, Garcetti, isn't that his name? That cheers my heart. But i got to be careful about letting my heart run wild in that direction. Because other, otherwise, then all I'll be is I'll be referencing the, these struggles on a horizontal level. And I don't want to lose sight. I don't want my heart to be so captivated that I lose sight of the transitory lightness of this and the reality of the heaven. Because, two reasons. God hasn't. I don't know where the psalm is. I should have looked it up. Uh, I think it's Psalm 2, but I'm not sure. Uh, why do the heathens rage and the nations imagine vain things against the Lord and his anointed? The Lord seated in heaven laughs. We had a, and I'll share this a little bit more in detail later, somebody can. We had an ascension this week where 
we had the privilege of being lifted up as if we were eagles flying. It wasn't like we turned into eagles, but that was our perspective. And it was uncanny because we could look all over the country and we could see all these individual things going on, like the battles going on in Georgia and the battles going on in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. And, and it, was, it was fascinating because there was nothing that was anxiety creating from that perspective. And it was like the Lord lent us his view. And then we were able to start declaring and declaring. And a beautiful thing came out of it that I'll tell you when we get to the talking parts. But that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's not a big deal. That's why I wouldn't translate it with those words. It can be a huge deal. I mean, Paul was left for dead a couple of times on the side of the road. That's not good. But it also doesn't have the ability to redefine the essence and the nature and the substance of what's going on in heaven. So, if we back up a little bit, which you won't be able to see, it says that our faithfulness is the substance of things hoped for. That word, uh, hypostasis, is the exact same word that is translated in the New King King James by the word person in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, where it says that he is the exact representation of glory and the the, uh, exact outshining, the precision, the exegesis of his person. In the same way that everything that the Father is, when you look at Jesus, you see him. Everything that heaven is, when you can see it with faith, is the thing that becomes the evidence of the victory. So let me tell you my personal story about faith. Um, A long time ago in this room right over here, I got a chance to pray for a little gal named Allie. She had an abscess in her her gum, and uh, she brought a friend up from school. And I had just been wrestling with praying for the sick and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, so I was just really going to get into Jesus. And finally, I'm just standing there, and I feel like Jesus is right next to me. And she's standing there. And he goes, you do have to speak to it and tell it to go. And I, I said, okay. So I spoke. I said, go in Jesus' name. And it was healed instantly. It was super cool. And it, it, was, the, it was like the easiest thing ever. I mean, oh, my gosh, let's start a business, you know. This, <laughs> It's just the easiest thing ever. You guys have all experienced that, where the Lord's done something like that. He answered a prayer just like that. I used to think that that was somehow part and parcel with faith. And I'm not saying it's not, but it's not like the faith that I am carrying right this moment. Because whatever cognizance of this gift of faith that I had when I prayed and spoke and Allie was healed, it was gone as soon as the event was over. Now, I remember it fondly to this day. But early in this process, when I was saying, am I up to this? Am I up to standing against this? Do I have the faith to do it? I didn't know the answer to that question. But when the Lord showed me a vision of Trump's second inaugural, with everybody there, all the enemies, everybody reeking of repentance and humility, and a big banner flying over the top that said forgiveness, I I felt like I had tangible evidence of the substance of what God wants. And I have not doubted it one minute in the last several weeks. I've never experienced that in my life. I've never had faith pull me along. I've been the one to try to generate faith. And I'm not saying that's a totally unworthy effort. But what I'm saying is, me personally, because of what I've seen from the unseen I have an experience abiding with me through this three weeks or whatever it is, uh, four weeks. I have a kind of interaction with faith that I don't remember ever having in my life. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And that's what I want us to, to have because 
That's what will sustain us. That's the overwhelming evidence. It's not going to come from Fox News or Newsmax. And it sure isn't going to come from CNBC and MSNBC. And so that's what I'm meaning. Faith is the substance. It's the reality, the realness of the thing hoped for. It's the actual thing itself. And when you think about that, the victory politically and legally and all that that we're looking for to happen here in the United States is something that does not begin here any more than you being able to love begins here. Any more than peace starts here. These are all things that come from the kingdom. Jesus gives us his peace, not like the world gives. We love because he first loved us. If God has a plan for Donald Trump in America, a continuing plan, and I believe he does, think about it for a second. That plan doesn't start here. It starts here. We need to see it. When we see it, we're seeing it. We're seeing all of it that there is, and now faith becomes the evidence, the proving of that down here. I don't prove that by gritting my teeth and standing. And I see that now. And I think this is going to have big effects on my life and our lives for other stuff too. Prosperity, praying for the sick, outreach, evangelism, transforming people's lives. This is why, oh, anyway, which one? Oh, yeah, the transitory lightness question. All right, so do you, do, can you agree that the manifestation at this level of what we're suffering under and in with COVID, with corruption, with Pluto, that it is something that is transitory and light compared to the substance, the reality that is in heaven. I'm not... Okay, amen, amen. Well, that's good, that's good, that's good. That's, that's real good. Uh, and it's, the reason is because the things which you're seeing are just for a season. Now, uh, the Lord's been talking to me, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm preparing to, to try to help you guys hear what he's been sharing with me. He's been talking to me about aeons. Aeons. Eons, you know, aeons. And, uh, and, and that aeons are time periods. You, you know in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, that it talks about uh, that Jesus is the one through whom God made the aeons, the ages. And so I, I taught a while ago, and I think all of you guys have heard that teaching. I taught about how those carry the redemptive purposes of Jesus with them. Well, the Lord's been talking to me about aeons being periods of time set aside for a purpose. And they are, they are things that happen in our lives. We're in an aeon right now. This, this big event that we're all praying about is an aeon designed for a purpose. And an aeon contains all the components of the struggle, of the battle, of the evidence, and it's, it's fed by heaven, and it's resisted by earth, and all this kind of stuff. But there's always enough resources in it. And that's another thing that I'm beginning to see that I didn't used to understand. I felt like I was having to compete with resources with other people. But I'm walking through an aeon. We're in an aeon. And I want us to be able to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus as we run the race set before us. And the Lord told me that you interpret that race in your past as being a work that you have to do. But that's how we look at aeons. We set a time before you that's going to do something, and the primary thing that's going to come out the other end of that aeon is a transformed you. But this is still important. And then another aeon will contain that. Anyway, see, that's why I'm not capable of teaching, because all I could possibly do is confuse you right now. But it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating. Aeon. Aeon. Aeonios. Aeonios. All right. 
So, uh, yeah, so in a comparison, in, in comparison, this is passing. This is passing. Uh, if COVID would take one of our lives, God forbid that that should happen. I loved what Tim said last week, I think it was, or week before last we were talking about it. You said, hey, everybody's going to die. Let's at least live while we're in the process, you know, of getting there. And you can see when people don't have a vision up here, oh my God, they're so subject to slavery and fear. So subject to it. That's one of the things I think that we're battling politically is we have one group of people who are, are enamored with the idea of controlling people through fear. And another group of people who don't want to be controlled by fear and don't want to control people by fear. And as bombastic as our current president is, it's pretty odd that he's one of the, I don't like to control people by fear people. <laughs> you know? So hence, he doesn't start wars. He's bringing troops home. He's doing all these kind of things. So I'm not saying stuff's not worth fighting for. It is. I'm not saying it's not, not significant, because it is. I believe it passionately. I'm just saying that, not that I'm an expert, but when the Lord was gracious enough to show me some things, that became the substance of this reality. I think, I think what he actually showed me was the substance of the reality. And that became the evidence then that I could build, and I found myself with faith. I found myself, uh, not to say it's not assailable, because if I get on and watch a bunch of news, there'll be some weird thoughts coming in. But uh, I don't do that very much. And when I do, I kind of scratch my head and I go, that's not what you said, Lord. And all of a sudden, the, the reality of these visions and the things I've heard you guys see and say and everything came back. So that's what I want to do. I want to rally around that a little bit. Have you seen or heard of the unseen? It could be ascension experiences. It could be prophecy. It could be scriptural insight. It could be dreams. It could be prayer inspirations. It could be some declarations that you've made. Um, it could be more than that. It could be anything that the Lord's doing because he's speaking to us. He's sharing with us. And so I really want to take the time tonight, because here's another thing that, that I think is going to start weighing on us if we're not careful, and that's deadlines. I mean, the 14th is supposed to be the Electoral College vote. That's just uh, 10 days from now. So it seems like 10 days is the deadline. Oh my gosh, we've got to get it done in 10 days. I don't know. It doesn't feel like that in light of what I've seen. And I mean literally, it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't cause my heart to beat faster. It doesn't make me anxious. It doesn't make my gut turn. Um, I can even ask myself the question, Larry, if after all of this and all the, what you've seen, if it doesn't turn out, I can ask myself that question or somebody could ask me that. And it's weird. I can't even really formulate an answer. And I think that's a manifestation of faith. Like I've never really experienced. I'm not trying not to have an answer. I just go, well... You know, I'd just rather wait and see. I mean, I'd wait. I, I want to see what I saw. And, and when I think about that, just that way, I just want to see what I saw. I get so excited about it. I go, wow, that is going to be awesome. So anyway, and then there's little bits and pieces that feed it. So what I want to do is I want to write down what you guys have seen. So uh, I'll put mine first. Uh, I saw... Trump's uh, second inauguration. Inauguration. With a banner. A banner of forgiveness. Yes, sir. The deadline you mentioned isn't the deadline in heaven. No. No, it's not. That's a fact. That's a fact. These are all, uh, these are all uh, chronos issues here on earth. I don't know how. Anybody else see anything? Anybody have a dream? Uh, well, I didn't have a dream, but I had a, uh, I had a vision very similar to that. Uh, mine was specifically... Uh, the president with his hand on the Bible. Okay. Taking the oath.
Anything else? Yeah, no? I saw, um, of all the first ladies, Melania Trump has only had maybe one or two interviews in magazines. Uh -huh. And those were before she, um, they were elected into the White House. And I saw her on the cover of a magazine, and she was being interviewed as the first lady. Okay, now remember, this could be a sensory experience. It could be prophecy, scriptural insights, dreams, prayer, inspiration, declarations, just something of an open vision. Any, anybody else? We can share these with one another. This is evidence. This is, this is like what they're presenting in these hearings <laughs> that nobody's covering. I stood there and watched them run 4,500 ballots through eight times. You know, I mean, oh, well, that's not evidence. No, this is evidence. Only this is real evidence. This is the evidence of the substance of the thing, the absence of the reality of it. Jen. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night a couple of weeks ago and just since something was going on and so I was just praying and uh, and then when I kind of came to my senses I saw that uh, the comparison of the numbers of the electoral votes and I don't remember what the numbers were uh -huh. I just remember saying to myself oh I thought Trump would have showed a bigger margin but the fact that he won was the main thing <laughs> oh that's cool <laughs> Uh, electoral votes in and tabulated in Trump won. Now, think about this. Think about this. Just that one thing. There are state uh, houses and senates battling to repudiate the fraudulent results of the election and reclaim their constitutional right to appoint electors. If you go on that, what's that Ballotopia? Is that the name of the website? They have, in a lot of these states, they have the names of the electors that are committed. Mm -hmm. You could go pray for them, but it's not over. Tim. Yeah, I'll share what we had in our uh, ascension yesterday. Cool. It was really neat. We were when we were praying, and in the ascension mode, we saw a, a streak of blue light, which was the Holy Spirit, and that streak of blue light went through the White House. Okay. And that streak of blue light, which was the Holy Spirit, turned to a bright white light, and it lit up everywhere in the White House and in the surrounding area. And then we saw that light go across and around the earth. So it started there and it was all about fixing the election process to start with, that that would be made right. And then because it hasn't been right all around the earth, it was made right all around the earth. and. What happened then was, and so all of this was taking place, and at the very end, I saw a rainbow surrounding the whole earth, and God's promise fulfilled. Okay, well this one might seem a little weird, and it was not recently, but my, this dream happened right when Trump was in, um, elected in 2016, kind okay. of at that same time. Okay, um, it I, still could serve as evidence of what it can't. God's plan is in the yeah. heavens, right? And, and it was for me, it was for my comfort, Okay. that the Lord um, showed me that I was well, in the dream, I was married to Trump, and he was wow. keeping me. It's, it's, that's why I said, like, kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I knew in my spirit it wasn't, you know, anything 
Weird. It wasn't like replacing Doug. It was a. Uh, yeah. It had a symbolist symbolism mm -hmm. to it. Anyway, he was like keeping me in an apartment, and he would come by and check on me and make sure I had everything I needed. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> like he was my sugar daddy or something. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> From the tape, maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's fully, fully recovering now. Anybody on Zoom got anything they want to add to, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I, what's been stirring with me is it's not so much a revelation uh, regarding our presidents and, and all of that, but uh, it's really been stirring with me. Um, the the opportunity every night to pray over my kids and and recognize that they're fully uh fully equipped the way they are right now that there's nothing lacking in them and so that when i think think about our church and and the the path that we've had uh just in in five years and then for many of you for many more years before that where you really cut your uh teeth into who joyland is uh you know that's that is, in a nutshell, um, recognizing that our reality is the kingdom reality of, of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Our perspective is theirs. And so, uh, so really developing that mindset and, and trying to maintain that, uh, that mindset is, is who we are. And, and so um, that's really been sticking with me in that I know that we have all reacted and, and, and had a variety of emotions and, and some, some of us have really been pretty strong and we know what's going to about to happen and things of that nature. But, but the bigger goal for me is that regardless of whatever happens over the next few months, we're fully equipped uh, to, to shine and shine brighter. And so going back to, I'll just leave it with this, going back to the book of Acts, uh, chapter eight, um, where the church was struck um, that's an exciting story to me, uh, and I'll just read just a few glimpses of it. Uh, that day, a great and re relentless persecution broke out against the church, and the believers were all scattered. Wrong thing? Bad thing? No, a very good thing. And then, uh, reading down a, a little bit more, Saul began to ravage the church. Now, those believers who had been scattered went from place to place, preaching the word, the good news of salvation of Christ. And so, uh, that part really just excites me that uh, strike us as much as you want, uh, evil one, uh, not speaking to, to man, not speaking to flesh, but evil one, strike us as much as you want, and that's what you're going to get. And so uh, I hope that's just encouraging for all of us. Uh, obviously, I'm looking forward to a, a, a President Trump remaining and, and reconciliation happening and, and a complete turnaround in relationship. With, with those individuals that seem to hate each other right now. But, uh, but even above that, you know, we need to know who we are. And, and, and uh, we're, we're pretty big stuff because he's big stuff. So that's my two cents. How many of you uh, had a chance to, or took a chance to participate in the Dutch Sheets thing the other night praying? Cool, good. I, I didn't actually learn about it for whatever reason. Again, I'm not trying to follow a lot of things too much, but I didn't learn about it until a Bible study that afternoon at 5 o'clock that I had with some guys back on the East Coast. And so I, uh, as soon as I got off that and I got done with Tuesday night, that's why I sent you guys that late text notice. I know a lot of you, it, probably too late, uh, but it was just as quick as I could. Anyway, that was pretty significant. I mean, I, I, Vic and I set the alarm. We woke up. We made that declaration. We were able to declare the things that I had on my heart and that we had. Uh, about uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. At the same time, Doug sent me a video, and I understand, Jen, you had circulated among some people too, of uh, uh, Johnny Inlow and his wife talking with, with uh, Steve Schultz. And uh, how many saw that uh, Inlow interview? That's pretty powerful. So I'm sitting there listening to it, and it's amazing. I don't know where he gets all this information. I don't know if it's prophetically released or he knows something about the various things that are going on. And then I had followed a little bit with uh, Sydney Powell because we sent that money to her. And uh, I was so encouraged. Now, this is horizontal encouragement, but I was so encouraged when that thing happened in Georgia where the judge on Saturday said, you can't wipe the voting machines. And then three hours later, he said, no, I'm going to re rescind that order. And then I found out that the order was redone 
at 10 o'clock that night or 10.30. And I'm thinking, yeah, that gal's on it, man. They were in a judge's chamber at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday to make this happen. So that was encouraging on the, on the horizontal level. But then when, when I listened to in-laws, pro, uh, prophetic conversations and stuff, it solved a problem that I had with one of the revelations the Lord had given me. Uh, and that was to declare over President Trump mercy triumphs over judgment. And I had a very vivid experience doing that through the ascension and then ever since, personally, and I've been continuing to, to do that. But I remember the very first time the Lord said it, and I, was, I just was going to obey and do it, but I thought, that's weird. He's kind of the victim in this. But if you think about what Enlo says, and this turns around, he's not going to be the victim. He is going to be the one person on the face of the planet that has both the, the situation and the authority to represent the reality that mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, when I shared that with Vicki, she got mad at me and said, so you mean they're just not going to... I said, no, no, no. I go, they're going to... Okay? <laughs> I said, they're, they, you, you're not going to get pardoned until you get convicted. And until it's all shown. But I got my teeth into a vision of literally a world revival that's, that could sweep through the power elite. That's pretty powerful. I can't let go of that. So anyway, that was a cool one. Um, so I saw the reason that that had the uh, um, ability to pour burning coals on everybody's head. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay, anybody else? Any uh, prayer inspirations? Any scriptural insight? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not a very good drawer. It's all stick people. <clears throat> so I saw this big fiery beastie thing. Okay. And I was looking at it, and the one thing that caught my attention was its eyes. It wasn't mean. It wasn't going around trying to destroy stuff. It looked nervous or scared. And then when I got a little vision of it, like a pullback, it was surrounded by these smaller angels all around it blowing trumpets at it. And I, yeah, I was just blowing trumpets at it, and then it was trying to get away, trying to get away, going this, and it was like underneath, you know, in a dark area. And then... Another pullback, and there was an angel, uh, another uh, angel about twice as big as the smaller angels blowing the trumpets. It had this big sword just pointed right at it, just ready. It was just sitting there ready. No one's nervous. But this thing was just, that with the eyes, it just kept looking up, and it's trying to get away. And everywhere it goes, these little angels are blowing these trumpets at it. So I said, Lord, what the heck is that? What is it looking at? So finally I said, what, what's he looking at? So he uh, showed me that he was looking up at it like... To get out, it's not like he was underneath in the earth, trying to get out, and there was a hole, and I could see the sky, but he didn't want to go out, you know? Yeah. So he didn't want to be exposed or some sort. That point yeah. I kind of got out of it. And finally, I, I had that a couple weeks ago. I finally said, hey, what's going on with that beastie thing? And it got out of the hole, and it's kind of going around, in the, you know, on top, and then it's trying to get back in the hole with these little angels all around. It can't go do nothing. It's yeah. constantly surrounded. Well, the hole filled in, and then a tree grew out of that thing, and a nice, big, beautiful tree, and it's trying to get in the hole, and it just inflamed and just encompassed the tree. So now that there's a tree and, like, a flaming tree, but it's not burning. So there okay. you go. All right, so let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. So here's some evidence. Right? Here's some evidence that we've been privileged to know. Uh, there's some other evidence. The AP, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but the AP has declared Joe Biden the president-elect. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, does that compare to a big flaming beastie that's being displaced and now it's being replaced by the burning tree of life? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, you see what I'm saying? This is real stuff. That word, you know, uh, faith is the, the substance part. That's the same thing as Jesus standing there. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's that magnitude of evidence. You know, and some of that stuff has got to be backing up some of the evidence that's being presented. I know the evidence is, is happening. For instance, there was a video that just came out yesterday, I think. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it was some surveillance video in the Fulton State Farm Arena or whatever, where when they ask everybody to leave, a few, four uh, Democratic workers went and pulled suitcases full of ballots out from underneath tables. All right, now that's cheesy, but it's questionable as well. But Governor Kemp from Georgia has now put the pressure on the Attorney General to investigate that. Now, Kemp was wanting this thing to go away as fast as possible because he's got his fingers in the cookie jar, maybe, who knows. This stuff is going on. These things we've seen. The light is exposing. Anyway, one last thing that the... G yeah, that the can oh, I yeah. say something to that because it's been really resonating? You know, at the beginning of the year, many people were getting that 2020 was going to be the year of clearer vision. Mm, and that's things right. are being brought into the light. That's right. That's right. I got to get one in. <laughs> um, let you finish. So I know that we, there's so many stories in the Old Testament that are, you know, parallel to what we're experiencing. The one that stands out, and we can't, you know, neglect this one is, it seems we're in a Red Sea moment. Yeah. And, you know, we're up against the sea. We've got... We're being surrounded, and uh, all we can do is look to the Lord right now, you know. So, so there, and then there's Gideon's army. Yeah, You've there's got, a lot of those. It's, it's reduced this is to how God works. That's another bit of evidence. This is how God works. Right. Yeah, yeah, this is how God works. Uh, if, you read, if you read Hebrews chapter 11, it's that way. But you also got to read yeah. Hebrews chapter 11 and say, you know, none of these got the full promise. But nope. that didn't stop it from being real, and it didn't stop it from moving Israel forward, moving the revelation forward, and all that. Right. And then there's the Jordan, yep. you know, crossing the Jordan. So, I mean, it's yeah. all written in, the, there's keys written in the Word. They are. Another story, this was in the Ascension on Wednesday. The Lord started speaking about having enough time. He said, think of Joshua. Joshua asked the sun to stand still so he could finish the battle. That was when the pressure from the 14th in the electrical college, electoral college dissipated my mind. Oh, yeah. Stop the sun, Lord. The 14th can stay away as long as you want, however you want. There's big stuff going on here. The 13th could be like three days all It could. It could. And then all of a sudden, the, the next day would be the 17th, and they would go, darn. That's uh, not where I mean. I mean, seriously, this is the kind of stuff. You're right, Janet. It's all throughout Scripture if we see it. Uh, and and it, it's a bit of a manifestation of the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs at the plots and the schemes of men. It really does. So I think we should, that's what I meant when I said join him in the laughter. Don't let this become too oppressive because there's plenty of evidence to hang your hat on here. Plenty of evidence. Yeah. Anybody else on Zoom want to share? I'll just um, also agree with what was shared about 2020. That's what God's been really focusing me on is we started the year with, I, I started the year with a declaration of eyes on Jesus for, for 2020 heavenly vision. And I really believe now it's clear why God called that out and why he's using the correlation with 2020 and opening our eyes to, to the truth and to seeing what he sees. I agree. I agree. I will just say one uh, preliminary benefit already that's amazing. Two, two. 
Um, and I know this was in question a little bit at the first of the issue when everything was all jumbled up. In my lifetime, I've never seen the church rally around a cause like it is right now. People from all different denominations and different church groups are praying the way they know to pray. They're prophesying if they have prophecy in their camp. They're ascending. They're calling prayer things. There really is a lot. And then I read an article the other day about the uh, record turnout to vote from evangelical Christians and almost 100% for, for Trump. Most of them are for Trump. Um, so anyway, there's been some progress. All right, so real quick. Uh, I wanted to have communion. Richard called said we should have communion. Great minds think alike. We have a lot of bread. <laughs> we have enough stuff. I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, we got plenty. Uh, so I, I don't want to take a ton of time, but I want us to have communion. So if you guys have your communion elements up there on Zoom, uh, go ahead. Uh, Father, this is the gift that you've given us of the blood and the body of Jesus. Something that I've been struck with lately as I've been taking communion is that when we ingest the bread that is your body and when we drink and ingest the, the wine that is your blood, it literally becomes part of us. I'm more familiar with that now because I know that like the bread and the wine can cause a little spike in my blood sugar since I'm checking it. And I'm going, wow, that's amazing. I can measure you in these elements becoming a part of me. And for some reason, that is like wildly encouraging and wildly edifying. So, Lord, we are going to partake. We're going to share from this loaf. We are going to share this offering of your blood. We're going to share it with uh, those of us on Zoom and those of us here. And I pray that as you, as we partake of you and as you manifest the reality that you promised in John 14, that you'll be in us and we'll be in you. I pray that the substance of this evidence, the reality of it, will flood our hearts and fill our minds and strengthen our resolve and strengthen our bodies so that the weary or potentially weary part of us won't be subject to it. Whether it's COVID, whether it's the wear and tear of life, the fact that each day has enough trouble of its own, or whether it's the political climate here or abroad. I pray, Father, that you will flood us with the very presence of Jesus as we partake.